Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall, and welcome to another season of great football action on This Week in the NFL. And this year, Tom, we might even have more great action because there have been some changes made in the NFL. Pat, in most cases, those changes worked out the way they were really hoped for. On opening day, for instance, kicks were returned for a record rate. Almost 90% of all kickoffs were returned, and there were only six fair catches in the entire league. Tom, as far as field goals were concerned, only 36 were tried on opening day, opposed to 53 last year. And only 19 field goals were successful, as opposed to 32 last year. The strangest thing of all, I think, was that only 443 points were scored, as opposed to 543 last year. 100 less. What do you suppose are well, so I, few points I scored? I think we're getting some strange defenses. They're not strange to college ball, but Fairbanks has the 3-4 uh, or the old 5-4 up at uh, New England doing very well with it. The nickel defense is in now, the prevent. And we're seeing some strange defenses. I think the coaches might be very conservative of how they attack them right now. It's going to take some time, I think, to get used to the new defenses. Right. Even the Redskins used some of Miami's 53 defense last, uh, right. last week against the Giants in the game I was at. It's, it's a strange look, I think, for the most part. Well, the Cardinals and the Eagles, two good scoring teams. That final score was 7-3 with a long gainer by Gabriel of only 18 yards. They're just having to play it close. So we think it's going to take some time. <laughs> but whatever, we'll be right back with this week in the NFL after this message. The Baltimore Colts have plenty of question marks and the youngest team in the NFL. Last week in Pittsburgh, they ran into a legitimate contender and a cat named Jefferson Street Joe. Baltimore is a young, eager, anonymous team with a young, eager, anonymous coach. But the Colts and Howard Schnellenberger hope to surprise some people in 74. Last week, the Colts did just that with a healthy first quarter drive against the heavily favored Pittsburgh Steelers. Glenn Doughty's catch moved the ball close, but with fourth down and one foot to go for a TD, the Callow Colts met their match at the Steel Curtain. The Steeler defense turned Baltimore back, then turned the ball over to the man of the hour. Jefferson Street Joe Gilliam had won the Pittsburgh quarterback lottery with an incredible preseason aerial show. Now he would try to defend his position by the same method. Under Gilliam, the freewheeling Steeler offense looks like a throwback to the early pass-happy 60s, with super cool number 17 filling the air with hard, tight spiral. Gilliam has an added advantage this year. A new fleet of sure-handed receivers like rookie John Stallworth, number 82. Another rookie target for Gilliam's slingshots is number 88, Lynn Swan. With the Colts reeling from the long-distance bombing, Gilliam displayed a new talent, the poise to set up and feather touch a screen pass. Then number 35, Steve Davis, piled up more passing yardage with his legs. Gilliam had passed his first test. In all, the hot shot from Tennessee State completed 17 of 31 for 257 yards and two touchdowns. The first on a fly pattern to Lynn Swan. The second on a sprint out to number 43, Frank Lewis. While Gilliam staked his claim to a permanent position, the steel curtain was making things miserable for the struggling Colts. Number 47, Mel Blunt, snuffed out Baltimore's last hope to avoid a shutout and gave the Steeler offense a chance to prove it had more than Joe Gilliam's right arm to depend on.
Number 32, Franco Harris, made the running game look healthy as well. And the Pittsburgh Steelers rolled to an impressive 30 to nothing victory. Well, Pat, it didn't take long for the AFC Central Division race to really heat up. Very first week, Tom, and already a crucial game. Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium was a sunny setting for a game they call the Championship of Ohio. But a Bengal Browns game goes deeper than just a mythical title. The same man created both these teams, and the Paul Brown influence permeates all from organization to uniform colors. There is also the matter of a divisional title to be contested, and so the Bengals went right to their game breaker, number 85, Isaac Curtis. Spectacular effort was wasted, however, on a bingo fumble, and the rest of the first half turned into a headhunting defensive standoff. In the face of hard hitting give and take, Cincinnati cracked first as number 26 Charles Davis fumbled inside the bingo 10. ball and with less than a minute remaining in the first half number 15 Mike Phipps stood up to the safety blitz and hit Milt Morn for the game's first score the Bengals were left with time for just one more play and 50 yards away number 14 Ken Anderson went right back to his main man Isaac Curtis was ruled out on the one and not a second too soon. With one tick remaining, the Bengals faced an all or nothing proposition. Number 42, Booby Clark muscled in, and the game which had been scoreless 38 seconds before was now tied 7-7. But only Cincinnati's first half flurry carried over. The Bengal defense set the pace as number 70, Ken Carpenter, dropped Phipps in the Cleveland end zone for a safety. The defense gave Cincinnati a lead, and then Ken Anderson went back to a nearly sure thing. Once again, Isaac Curtis beat the Browns, this time for six. Next, tight end Bob Trumpy, number 84, worked free over the middle for another score. But the most spectacular performance in Cincinnati's second half extravaganza was turned in by Lightning Lamar Parrish, number 20, a defensive back and punt returner extraordinaire. With a 33-7 blowout of the Browns, Cincinnati served notice to the rest of the league. The championship of Ohio just may be the first step to the championship of the world. In the past two seasons, the Houston Oilers have registered only two victories against 26 losses. However, this season, a number of new faces fill the Oilers' starting roster. Last Sunday against the San Diego Chargers, improvement over the two previous disastrous seasons seemed to be a sure thing. In order for the sagging fortunes of the Houston Oilers to be reversed, head coach Sid Gilman must get good, consistent play from several young key players. One is a talented free agent rookie runner named Ronnie Coleman, number 47. Against the Chargers last Sunday, this 37-yard jaunt was but a part of 123 yards rushing by Coleman. And it put the Oilers in close enough for a short scoring blast by second-year fullback George Amundsen, number 12. Houston's defense then rose to halt a San Diego drive as Charger quarterback Dan Fouts, number 14, misfired under heavy pressure. And linebacker Steve Kiner, number 57, intercepted.
Niners theft gave Oiler quarterback Lynn Dickey a chance to show his wares. And the former Kansas State star responded with 19 completions for 195 yards on the afternoon. Dickey's lone touchdown pass came on a release pattern to fullback Amundsen, whose second effort upped the Oiler lead to 14 to nothing. In the second quarter, the Chargers retaliated with a hard run in Sid Edwards, number 37. Edwards would rush for 100 yards on the afternoon, while Dan Fouts riddled the Oilers' secondary with 13 completions for yardage totaling 209 yards. Fouts capped a seven-play march, giving the final span to number 21. Glenn Bonner got the score. On the Chargers' first possession of the third quarter, Fouts directed his club in for the tie as a 29-yard touchdown pass to Gary Garrison completed a five-play, 65-yard drive. Garrison's defender had slipped, leaving the ghost untouched for the score. However, when Fouts found tight end Wayne Stewart, number 89, open over the middle, Houston converged with a vengeance. Greg Bingham knocked the ball loose, and number 48, Bob Atkins, recovered, giving the Oilers excellent field position. As the fourth quarter began, Dickey fired deep across the middle for rookie number 84, Bill Johnson. Johnson's 35-yard reception put the Oilers in close, and two plays later, George Amundsen hurled in for touchdown number three and a 21-14 Houston victory. In days past, it was customary for Houston fans to get their biggest thrills watching opponents roll up enormous scores while catching a souvenir football from the toe of the opposition's kicker. That was regarded the big thrill. Perhaps, however, 1974 will be different for Houston, and with one victory already, Odds are in their favor that sometime during the next 13 weeks, the scoreboard will again register Oiler victory number two. The Philadelphia Eagles finished last season ranked the number one passing team in the NFL. And in last Sunday's opener against the St. Louis Cardinals, they faced a team that came out of 1973 ranked dead last on defense. Well, Pat, I guess that proves you can't believe all or everything you read or hear, huh? It was supposed to be a cakewalk for the Fire High gang, but the red-clad Cardinals evidently didn't read the write-ups as thoroughly as the visitors. By game's end, last year's number one passing team wound up with three faltering points on the board. It was not a showcase day for either club, but Cardinal quarterback Jim Hart did manage to put together one game-deciding drive, and he started it with a beauty to number 85, Mel Gray. Giving the drive momentum was a familiar name in an unfamiliar uniform. Number 20, Ken Willard, formerly of the 49ers. Hart gave his 80-yard creation a final stroke of mastery with a flip to a nine-year veteran, Donnie Anderson, number 44. And although the Cardinals' offensive production was low last Sunday, they do have some impressive firepower. Number 21, Terry Metcalf, is about as explosive as a fella can get. In the fourth quarter, the Cards put together a drive that brought both good news and bad news. The good news was a pass completion to wide receiver number 82, Earl Thomas who took it all the way to the Eagles' seven-yard line. The bad news was that they fumbled the ball away on the very next play. Suddenly, the Cardinals' bench was fidgeting with the remembrances of the Eagles' last play victory in 1973. Then, with less than two minutes remaining, Roman Gabriel orchestrated a 71-yard drive that carried the Eagles to the Cards' nine-yard line where they had 27 seconds to salvage victory.
But this year's victory went to last year's losers as four times Roman Gabriel dropped back to challenge the bad rep Big Red secondary. But four times the Cardinals rose above the Eagle effort. And the end St. Louis had earned themselves a get even victory that spoke far above the pundits forecast of what should have been. When the Redskins and Giants met last Sunday, the Washingtonians made one thing perfectly clear. And that was while their defense may be called the over the hill gang, they've still got a heck of a long climb down to the floor of the valley. For Washington's head coach, George Allen, football games are matters equally significant to such things as life and death. And his eight year string of opening day victories says a great deal about the preparation this man brings to a game. Last Sunday, that record was on the line again, and the man threatening it was Bill Arnsbarger, the rookie head coach of the New York Giants. Arnsbarger shares much of Allen's own philosophy about the game, and consequently, when his team took the field, they had a distinctive new sound, and it's called hard-hitting defense. But for all their improvement, the Giants weren't about to beat Allen at his own game. Number 41, cornerback Mike Bass picked this one off in the first quarter, and it was seven to zip, Redskins. When New York quarterback number 16, Norm Sneed, did complete his passes, the Redskins forced turnovers while showing a real lust for loose football. Billy Kilmer directed the offense, which revolved around the guttiest back in the business, number 43, Larry Brown, who made it 13-3, Redskins. On the following kickoff, Giant fans got a good look at Wonder Boy Doug Kotar, number 44. He started the season as a rookie free agent, but fought his way up to first string running back on opening day. But if Kotar's rise to fame is impressive, the Redskins' Herb Mulkeys is phenomenal. Number 28 also began as a free agent, but last season was the second-ranked return man in the NFL. And despite the fact that kicker Pete Gogolak tackled him, it's not hard to see why. Although the kickoff returns were exciting, it was New York defensive tackle John Mendenhall, number 64, who set up the only giant touchdown of the afternoon. Getting the call was number 44, Doug Kotar, who sliced through for the touch. But New York's celebrations were slightly premature as the Redskins defense withstood Mr. Kotar and company to capture George Allen's ninth studiously prepared for opener 13-10. Many people predicted this would be the year the Dallas Cowboys would collapse. The reasons given were the defection to the WFL had crumbled their morale and that Dallas was too long in the tooth, and too old in key positions, Peg. Well, against Atlanta last Sunday, the Dallas Cowboys were not too old, just too tall for the Falcons. Outside Atlanta Stadium, lush greens bathed the Falcon faithful in the twilight of summer. Inside, the heat was rising as the Cowboys and Falcons turned red. The two contending teams threw footballs and then fists at each other, but on this Sunday, Dallas proved the tougher team. Set back Calvin Hill, a defector to the World Football League, answered the question about whether he would save himself for the WFL as he showed his heels and then his hands to the Falcons. Roger Staubach, absent for the final two weeks of the preseason due to broken ribs, 
played with his old devil-may-care style and scrambled to Dallas's first touchdown. Although sacked seven times by the Falcons' ferocious rush, Roger hung in there and passed Dallas to a 17-0 bulge with a 32-yard rainbow to Golden Richards. But the hero for Dallas this day was the doomsday defense and a young quarterback crusher named Ed Too Tall Jones, number 72. Jones, the number one pick in the NFL draft, stands six feet nine inches tall, weighs 265 pounds, and his style reminds one of Deacon Jones in his halcyon years. Too tall, sacked Atlanta quarterbacks five times as he sailed in like a torpedo to explode in the face of the Falcon attack. Wherever he went, too tall left bodies in his wake as the doomsday defense completely stifled Atlanta and shut them out. By game's end, Dallas dominance was complete as Bob Newhouse squirmed over for the Cowboys' final score. The 24-0 pace team proved the Dallas Cowboys were a very healthy corpse in the race for the NFC East. Well, after one week of play, two teams are tied for the lead in the NFC Central. One of them always seems to be up there, but I don't believe the other team's been in first place since maybe we quit playing. That would have to be Abe Gibran's Chicago Bears, and they do have a different look about them this year. On the shores of Lake Michigan, there's a very old NFL team with a very new look, principally because Abe Gibron's quarterback is now number 19, second-year man Gary Huff. Last year against Detroit, Huff was intercepted three times in one game by free safety Dick Geron. In last week's opener, Geron intercepted Huff's first pass of the game, but Detroit was not able to cross Chicago's goal line until the fourth period when Steve Owens finally scored for the Lions. Detroit's only other points came when Jim Mitchell blocked at Bob Parsons' punt out of the end zone for a safety. The rest of the day was pure torture for quarterback Bill Munson and the Lions. Six times, Munson was trapped, and the Bear defense held the Lion offense to a meager 156 yards total. Watch Chicago's number 60 Wally Chambers escape a hold to really get at the quarterback. also had some fun on offense with the newfound passing combination of Gary Huff to a rookie from Tennessee State, Charlie Wade, number 83. Charlie Wade claims he had never been caught from behind, and if it weren't for a bad leg, he wouldn't have been caught last week either. Such speed working for him, Gary Huff was able to fake out everyone in Soldier Field and then find another small but material flanker, Ike Hill, number 17. The Bears won 17 to 9, and depending upon the relative strength or weaknesses of the Lions, it just may be that the Bears have a defense and an offense this year. And if that is truly the case, NFL football is again going to become fun time in Chicago. 
for the players, for the fans, for Coach Abe Gibron, and even the Chicago Bear himself could be excused for losing his head. Only Bobby Douglas was seen leaving in a huff. Though the Bears were able to upset the Lions, the Minnesota Vikings still must be regarded as the team to beat in the black and blue division, the NFC Central, Tom. Well, that's a safe statement, Pat, especially after the very impressive opening day showing by the Vikings against their old rivals, the Green Bay Packers. In the last six years, the Green Bay Packers have been the only team able to knock the Vikings from atop the NFC Central division. Aware of the Vikings' expected strength for 1974, Packer fans were calling on a higher power for deliverance from the Norseman domination. However, the first series set the tenor of the contest as number 17 quarterback Jerry Taggy, attempting to pass to John Staggers, instead saw the aerial deflected into the hands of Viking safety Jeff Wright, number 23. Wright's return of 19 yards set up a Fred Cox field goal for a first quarter Minnesota lead. But the Packers fought back to match the three-pointer in the second quarter as the green and gold defenders held Fran Tarkenton virtually in check. Responding to the defensive surge, the Green Bay offense caught fire and marched in for the game's first touchdown. Behind a key block by number 62, Bill Luke, number 42, John Brockington, fought his way into the end zone to give the Packers the lead at 10 to 3. Not to be outdone, however, Tarkenton propelled the Vikings towards a tying touchdown. Number 44, Chuck Foreman, flashed through an enormous gap in the Packer wall for a 10-all halftime score. The third quarter began strangely enough like the game had begun. Number 43, Nate Wright silenced the Packers' first possession of the second half with a well-timed interception. Four plays later, a Chuck Foreman leap put Minnesota ahead to stay. The Viking defenders then got tough, and when Jerry Taggy reverted to the old college option, the only choice left open was painful. Controlling the tempo in the second half, the Vikings moved in close behind the thrust of Foreman and number 32, Osser Reed. Reed and Foreman combined for 200 yards in total offense and set up Foreman's third touchdown on a short burst around right in. After a field goal up the Viking lead to 26 to 10, the pack finally arose to fight back. Number 36, MacArthur Lane's 15-yard sprint brought Green Bay across midfield for the first time in the second half. Three plays later, number 84, Steve Odom took the reverse for all it was worth, finding pay dirt from 18 yards out. Now trailing 26 to 17, the Packers needed a good punt return to gain favorable field position as less than a minute remained. However, number 55, Amos Martin, gathered in the Steve Odom fumble and raced the final 16 yards to seal a most convincing Minnesota conquest, 32 to 17. With quarterback Steve Spurrier out for perhaps all of 1974, the San Francisco 49ers met the New Orleans Saints without their wing, and they needed a prayer. But against New Orleans, their prayer was answered. Saints quarterback Archie Manning spent most of Sunday running for his life, while his contingent of receivers ran over an embarrassing obstacle course consisting of benches, fences, and even retaining walls. Behind a patchwork offensive line, St. Archie offered his body as a feast for the rumbling waves of red that washed over him. 
So it was no surprise that San Francisco drew first blood when rookie Manfred Moore followed number 48, Sammy Johnson, in for six. Finally, Archie untracked New Orleans with zone-splitting passes to his tight end, John Beasley, number 85. New Orleans built a 13-10 lead on two field goals and Manning's touchdown strike to six-foot-five-inch rookie Joel Parker from the University of Florida. New Orleans clung to the 13-10 lead with 154 remaining. With it fourth and four, punter Donnie Gibbs botched a perfect snap, which resulted in personal comedy for Gibbs and tragedy for the Saints team. Safety Wendland Hall recovered for San Francisco. And one play later, Rookie running back Sammy Johnson swept his left in for the winning touchdown. Within a space of 30 seconds, New Orleans saw certain victory vanish into defeat. San Francisco had won a lucky one, but it's doubtful they'll be able to luck it out forever in the competitive NFC West. Preseason predictions are quite often a quiet form of professional suicide, Pat, but I see where a lot of the preseason pollsters like the Rams as a Super Bowl team. You could do a lot worse than that, Tom. The Rams are ultra-deep in running backs, have a crusher defense, and they can also hurt you with the big play, as the Denver Broncos found out last week. Last year, the Rams of Coach Chuck Knox gloried in the sun of a 12-2 record, the best in club history. This year, they expect better. For Denver and their coach, John Ralston, last year was also a high-water mark, a season of smiles. But last Sunday, the Broncos needed all the firepower they could possibly muster. And so they started with a bang that knocked plucky Jim Bertelson for a looping somersault. The Rams weren't easily intimidated, and they breezed to an early lead as John Hadle hit tight end Bob Klein in the end zone. A repeat shows just how wide open the six-year veteran from Southern Cal was on the last play. Broncos tried gamely to keep pace on the slashing runs of number 24 Otis Armstrong, which led to a Denver field goal and cut the home team's deficit to seven points. But on the following kickoff, the Rams' Cullen Bryant parlayed a combination of muscle and speed for 84 yards, and as they say in the trade, that's all she wrote. Bryant, who's listed as a third-string running back, points up the Ram talent and depth that's going to have a lot of coaches going to their hankies this year. The Never Say Die Broncos came up with their lone touchdown of the day on a Charlie Johnson connection to Billy Van Heusen. That closed the scoring gap to 17-10. But then the Rams' defense, led by the ageless and perennial All-Pro number 74, Merlin Olsen, rode the Broncos down. The constant Ram pressure forced Denver into mistakes of execution and withered their confidence as the Rams took the victory 17 to 10. For the Broncos, the loss was disheartening, for they as a team feel they have arrived. Despite the loss, chances are good they're right. And there will be some great, beautiful Colorado football days ahead. Football is so much a team sport that there are very few individual players the fans would pay to see, no matter who else is on the field. Last week, one of those very special players began his 10th season in pro football. Opening day in Kansas City is always a festive event. And this year, there was a very important celebrity guest.
In the season's very first quarter, Joe Namath had the Jets off and winging as he completed five of seven passes, including a perfect touchdown dart to tight end Rich Castor. In the second quarter, Namath continued to fire away at the Chiefs' defense, and before Kansas City could wake up, Namath had the Jets on the scoreboard again. A touchdown pass to Eddie Bell and a 13-0 lead. Late in the first half, Lynn Dawson finally got the Chiefs going with some darts of his own. A key play was a deep pass to wide receiver Larry Brunson, a flashy rookie from Colorado. The Chiefs' first touchdown of 1974 came on a familiar-looking sweep by Ed Podolak. Leading 16-7 with only 20 seconds left in the half, Joe Namath tried for field goal possession. A defensive end, Marvin Upshaw, number 81, came up with the game's biggest play and the first touchdown of his entire football career. For the Chiefs and their faithful, a dreary-looking day now showed great promise. And who could blame them for trying to drum up more of the same? Sure enough, with just two minutes to go in the game, Joe Namath threw for the sideline. Emmett Thomas stepped inside his man, and it was all over but the shouting. Kansas City won 24 to 16 by intercepting Joe Namath four times and returning two for touchdowns. For the first time in five years, the Chiefs had won their opener, and for one week at least, they were all alone in first place of the AFC West. Every year, the NFL season opens with a scattering of minor upsets and an occasional credibility tester that's so difficult to believe that people think they've read the wrong score when they see it, Tom. Boy, Pat, that's exactly what happened to me last week when I saw the Miami-New England score. It looks like the Patriots fired the shot heard round the league and hit the Dolphins right between the eyes. This is Don Shula, coach of the two-time and current world champion Miami Dolphins, who last week could afford to be relaxed and coolly confident. Well, their opponents were Chuck Fairbanks Patriots, who in the last few years have been considered a breather on most people's schedules. But from the outset, number 16, Jim Plunkett, breathed feisty life into the New England offense. When Plunkett wasn't striking through the air, five foot five inch Mac Heron blasted up the Miami middle like a short ton of dynamite to give his team a seven nothing advantage. A replay shows that Heron exploded hard on Dolphin safety Dick Anderson number 40 on his way to a lead, the Patriots would never relinquish. When Miami tied at 7-all, Mighty Mike Mack kept his magic motor in high gear and put the Pats in excellent position. Then Jim Plunkett honed in on number 33, Reggie Rucker, and the Patriots looked like they were for real.
Not only was the offense sparkling, but the defense kept Bob Greasy under great pressure all day. An interception by rookie linebacker Sam Hunt set up this keeper by Jim Plunkett, and the Pats led at 24 to 7. The question was, where was no name? The answer was that no name was nowhere. And when they tried to tighten up number 39, Sam the Bam Cunningham, busted loose on a pop that put New England in good shape for the morning headlines, 31 to 10. Sensing that the score was beginning to border on the absurd, the Dolphins flared briefly to life. Bob Greasy's bombing run started with a strike to incomparable Paul Warfield and ended with a six-pointer to Marlon Briscoe, number 86. Then, for a moment, the Dolphins looked like they were going to pull it out when Larry Zonka's touchdown narrowed the New England lead to 31-24. But the Patriots had hooked a big fish, and they weren't about to let it slip away as they added a field goal and then pressured Greasy repeatedly until he looked like a man stuck in a revolving door. When it was all over, the Patriots had outfought, outgained, outhustled, and outscored the world champions 34 to 24. If there's a better way to start a season, don't bother telling Chuck Fairbanks. He won't believe you. All right, let's climb out on the limb. We start out even. This is the only time I'll be even with you all year. Let's make some predictions. All right, there's some tough games to pick. How well, about Miami at Buffalo? Well, Buffalo played extremely well, but I can't believe the Dolphins won't really, really come back. I have to go with Miami. Well, so do I. I right. thought Miami uh, finally got it rolling at the end of the game last week, so we'll both uh, either win or lose there. St. Louis at Washington, how about that? I think the Redskins will score a little bit more on St. Louis than Philadelphia did. I'm going to have to go with Washington to make it 2-0. Oh. Okay, I like Washington also. Pittsburgh at Denver. I'm going to go for the upset here. I believe the Denver Broncos will bounce back and uh, knock Pittsburgh off up there. Steelers looked awfully tough, la tough last week against Baltimore. I'll go with Pittsburgh then, so we're different there. Kansas yeah. City or Oakland? Oakland. Oakland, you know, I go all the way to the Super Bowl and lose usually, <laughs> but I'm going to go with the Raiders to bounce back. All right, I like them too. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.